Right, are, are you ready? Yep. Sure. You got a cup of tea? <laughs> No, no, but that's all right. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us for the Brand Brains interview today. It's really great that we've managed to capture you because you're international high flyer now, aren't you? You've just opened up in another country, haven't you? Yeah, we just opened Singapore. Brilliant. So, so uh, which was which was fantastic. We used as, uh, the Singaporean Dramatic Arts Centre. It's a beautiful theatre. Um, we had over 400 people come along to our first event, so um, yeah, it was really, really exciting. Oh, amazing. And you've obviously got two books out now, so you're a best-selling author of two titles. How's that going? Uh, phenomenal. So um, the one that was released over a year ago, Entrepreneur Revolution, was actually back at number one. Um, it's been a top ten book all year. Um, but they, Amazon made a book of the day and it became number one for all business categories and number 76 for all books. Wow. Um, yeah, as a result of the promotion. So it was nice because it was number one when it was first launched um, and it had always been in the top 10, but um, it was very nice to be back in the top 100 books. Fantastic. Obviously, I mean, I really uh, um, was inspired to come on your Key Person of Influence program because I read your book, KPI. It must be five or six years ago. I mean, it was quite a long time that I read it. Um, and I've always had copies of it in my boardroom. And when clients came and did their strategy meetings, I, like Marianne, Marianne Page, she came to do a strategy session. I said, you've got to read this book. So she read the book and then went on the course. And so we've always recommended the course because it, it's beautiful very much. with what we well, do. I've just completed the revised edition of Key Person of Influence. Mm -hmm. um, there's a chapter in the book called um, Your Best Thinking Five Years Ago is Your Baggage Today. And yeah. I thought, well, goodness, it's been five years almost since we've written the book. So um, wow. so time to revise it. And, and I actually was shocked at how much stuff I wanted to change. Um, so it's so true. <laughs> um, uh, I... Uh, yeah, I, so I went through and I rewrote. The book has gone from the new edition will be ten, more than 10,000 words longer than wow. the old edition, and, and that's after cutting a whole bunch of stuff out. So. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So I want to ask you some questions about that a bit later on. With your Entrepreneur Revolution book, I just wanted to ask you what inspired you to write that one? Um, so... The thing that inspires me and the thing that I'm most passionate about is the times that we're living in. I think that, you know, after 10,000 years of human civilization that's mostly built upon geography and um, unless you were born in the right family, you don't have much power. Um, we now live in a world where um, you can be anywhere you like, sell anything to anyone anywhere in the world, like share an idea with anyone anywhere in the world, um, have a voice, have a message, uh, connect with the kind of people that inspire you no matter where they are in the world. Um, and I feel incredibly grateful and incredibly fortunate to be living in these times and I wanted a way of processing it myself and being able to think about it um, and I began to write that book. I actually began writing Entrepreneur Revolution before I wrote Key Person of Influence. Really? But, yeah. Um, and it was in the process of you know, sort of clarifying my thinking that I realized that, uh, that the first step that everyone has to take in this times that we're living in is to become a key person of influence. Um, if you're not doing those things, then you don't have the key to the door for the times that we're in. Um, and then the second step is about leverage and an entrepreneur revolution is about leveraging through entrepreneurship and, mm -hmm. and it's about um, setting up businesses and it's about taking advantage of the times that we're in. So it's... Um, you know, it's a book designed to A, outline and set a context for these radically changing times, B, to outline what are the key opportunities, and then how would you make the most of that, um, some of the mindsets and mm. some of the strategies. Yeah, that's brilliant. Because in your book, you, you do talk about uh, now being the age of the entrepreneur and don't get left behind. What would you say is um, is a really important thing? Because there are a lot of business owners now who they're not necessarily taking control of their brand and they're letting their, their business run them. <laughs> what would you yeah. say is a really important for, thing, a takeaway for them, those people? Well, the idea is, is that, look, if you look at the times we're in right now, we have everything from voice recognition and, and conversation recognition software right through to automation software, um, marketing channels that, you know, that spread very far and wide. 
uh, and put you in competition with people very far and wide. So it's not only, by the way, it's not only the opportunity that you've got to spread a message far and wide. Someone who lives in Miami could be taking your customers here in London or someone who lives in, you know, Sydney, Australia could be uh, your uh, best supplier or someone who, um, you know, your you know, marketplace uh, could dry up because of a new entrant in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the times that we're in are almost like a big wave and this wave is just building and building and building and has been for the last 10 years and it's really at that point where it starts to turn into a, a breaking wave and you, you either end up on the surfing side or you end up on the side that gets swept out to sea. That's how it works with a wave. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so really, I mean, to me it's almost, it's almost beyond talking to people who are totally head in the sand. Um, if they're head in the sand, then they're not ready to surf this wave anyway and they're mm-hmm. on the swept out to seaside and, and that's just the reality um, of the situation now. Um, but for people who are open, um, and people who have been, you know, getting excited about this and mm. taking small steps and surfing small waves and, you know, then, then now's the time to get around a great group of people and, um, and, uh, and surf this, this, this transformation that's happening. Yeah, and, well, God, that couldn't be true enough. We meet business owners all the time who they, they think that branding is Coca-Cola or Apple or Nike or some massive great big company they don't think that branding is for them they don't realize that as a small business their brand is just as important what what would you say to those people well first of all I understand it Um, I understand that a small business you know by the nature of it's being small is thinking very transactionally they just want to make sales Mm -hmm. Um, and and when you're small you think to yourself you know I really don't want to invest money into branding because I can't you know, I can't directly see how that would make any sales. Yeah. Um, you know, I just want to do stuff that is, is, is tactical so that I can make more sales. So it requires you to have a, have a different view of branding. And a brand, is, a brand is about a consistency and about a promise, and it actually does lead to a lot more sales. So, um, you know, investing in that, that, that clarity of communication and investing in that quality of communication, which is you know largely what branding is about, um, does actually translate to new sales. So I think what I would say to anyone who's starting up and who's thinking about branding in those terms is I'd say, hey, I understand where you're coming from. I really understand mm. that sales are important right now and that it's really important to make sales. Um, I also understand that this will actually lead you to making a lot more sales faster um, and that for an investment, in, in the way you look and the way you communicate and um, the quality of what you, you, you're getting across, um, this will provide you with a competitive advantage. Mm. And I guess that you'd know all about that kind of starting from scratch because I, mean, I love your story, landing in the UK, not knowing anybody and really building, well, using yourself as that test ground, becoming the key person of influence literally from scratch. So, I mean, I think that's absolutely amazing. And so many people, um, they're very privileged that they're already in their country and they already know people and they can already set up a business. You literally started from scratch. So what would you say are the top three things that gave your reputation and your brand the biggest boost to your credibility? What did you do? Well, if I go back to that time, um, I, I... there are a few things. I showed up. I showed up um, in London without knowing anyone, um, but I did have a very clear pitch. I knew what I was here to do, and I knew what I was here to. I knew the message I wanted to get out there, and um, and I had crafted a, a way of sharing that idea. And I, mm. I I was so I had with me a very powerful pitch, um, and I went out and I pitched a lot of people, um, and you know I sort of you know got the message out there by doing that. Um, I also had a proven product, so I was working with um, a, a product that I'd seen working in Australia and New Zealand and Singapore, and um, and I knew this product was a great product, so I was bringing in a proven product, and mm-hmm. the product had a lot of content written about it, so I was sharing a lot of content. I had a great product. Um, and then what I did is I raised my profile and did partnerships, so I um, put on these dinners, these dinner parties with about 20 people at a time. I invited the top key people of influence 
um, to the, these dinners. I paid for everything. And I uh, shared with them, you know, who I was and what I was up to. And then I invited them if they wanted to do a partnership with me, a joint venture with me, that I had a structured way of doing that. And, um, and as a result, I signed up a number of partnerships um, and was able to launch the business, you know, reasonably successfully um, um, uh, here in, here in uh, London. So, so they're the key elements to it. Yeah, that's fantastic. So just to recap on that, because I'm making my notes as well. So having a clear pitch. Make sure yep. you've got a clear pitch. Make sure you've got a good product that you can pitch. Uh, yep. And I, I guess, um, you know, we, we talk a lot on the Key Person of Influence program about intellectual property and yep. and product. We, you know, that's a brilliant part. That, that really opened our minds to, in fact, that's why we sold our business. Because <laughs> we realized that, um, and, and I want you to talk about this later, the, the mountain yep. of value that we were stood on was just so enormous that it was crazy to continue exchanging our time for money when, you know, we had all these amazing things. And there's so many small business owners who, who are kind of taking yeah. for granted the knowledge that they had. So turning that knowledge into a proven product. So yeah. then you've got a good pitch to be able to pitch that product. And then um, uh, obviously sharing the content around that product as much as you can. Uh, you said pitched to a lot of people. So uh -huh. obviously the more chance you have of getting to the right people, the more people you're pitching to. And I guess the more people you're pitching to, the more you're perfecting your pitch because you'll you get are, that yeah, response. Yeah, yeah, sharpening your tools. Um, and partnerships. So it, um, that, that's so important, isn't it? Because you, you were then able to access a lot well, more people. Exactly. I was new to London, but I was partnering with people who had 10-year-old businesses in London yeah. and had spent 10 years building up their databases and their contacts and connections. So it was that leverage of people who already had, had mm. been around. Brilliant. What would you say, just out of interest, when you when you had the people come into the room, you were paying for dinner, because uh, this is something that our, our readers might well want to do, uh, what would you say was the conversion when you shared your vision and your pitch? How many people roughly did you have in the room and uh, how many people came on board as a joint venture? Well, I think probably we would have had 30 in the room and about 20 would have had coffee with me afterwards, which, is what, I, which is what the next step was. Yeah. And then probably about 12 to 15 would have actually gone ahead and done something with us on yeah. the level of partnership. So roughly speaking, about 50-50. Yeah, um, they brilliant. Were, they were, they were hand-selected people um, yeah. who, uh, who we were working with. And also, I would imagine that... Um, that personal touch of putting on the, the meal. And this is another thing um, that, that small business owners, again, around mindset, I suppose, money mindset, is, well, you know, my God, if I outlay all this money, then, um, you know, what if they don't buy into it? But you just can't have that mindset. You've got to go in there knowing that well, you just, yeah, what your step to is. To a degree, I'd much rather know sooner than later. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I... Meeting with 30 people for dinner, you know, potentially, if I did it one-on-one, -on -one, would take a month. Yeah. Um, so I'm much more interested in the idea that I would know something like that within a day. Yeah. Um, you know, I, va I value my time a lot more than I value money. Yeah. So I'm more interested in quickly getting a result as opposed to worrying about money. I think um, money's completely made up. My time is probably the most real thing that I've got. <laughs> Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm never going to get that back. I can no. always make more money, but I can never make more time. No. So um, I'm much more interested in, in getting results quicker than even if it costs money. And that, I think, by the way, I think that's one of the fundamental shifts between entrepreneurs who make it and entrepreneurs who don't. Entrepreneurs who struggle tend to think money is real and think that money is scarce and tend to yeah. think that their time is abundant and that their time is renewable. Um, and in actual fact, I think the entrepreneurs who do really well think that their time is scarce yeah. um, and that money's renewable and money's not real. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that tends to be one of the differences.
Yeah, I, I tend to find, I don't know if you find this, but it's almost at that uh, 18 month to two year stage where a, a business tends to realize the value of their time and where they might have spent. <laughs> I met somebody the other week who um, he said, well, I designed my own business cards. And I said, really, can I have a look? And I looked and um, and he'd basically gone on to Google and he'd stolen all of these <laughs> images off of Google. And I said, God, how long did it take you to do this? It had taken him nearly a week to do it, but he was more impressed that he'd managed to get away with spending Vistaprint and doing it all himself than yeah. he was on getting it right and, and you think oh my goodness me there is a, a massive mindset shift that as yeah. you quite rightly say between um, kind of uh, employee mindset still to being that entrepreneur do you have any examples that you can share with us about the the power of positive thinking when it comes to business and the mindset around business um, well, I mean, for starters, I'm not a huge fan of positive thinking. I'm, um, I mean, I, I, I think positive thinking or personal development is good for its own sake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you feel that you're unhappy with, you know, your, your typical day of thinking, then maybe it's worth putting some time and energy into positive thinking or something along those lines. But I'm not a big believer in it. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so, I mean, that might be strange because a lot of people are. Not really. Um, but in, in, in the context of creating a very successful business um i know some pretty negative people who are very successful mm. um you know i know some people who are very messed up and who need therapy who are very 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 successful <laughs> um, uh, i certainly know some people who uh who are jaded cynical i know people who are um alcoholics um who are incredibly successful and i yeah. know people who are incredibly personally developed and positive thinking who are broke yes so um, yeah i know a lot of those too <laughs> yeah right? so, you know, i'm not look i'm not I'm not hugely into the concept myself. I think there's negative thinking has a, has as much value as um, positive thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, your guy with the with the crappy business card. Mm. Someone needs to say that's not going to work. Yeah. Um, and that mindset's not going to work. And someone needs to be negative with the guy. Someone actually needs to say you're just going to waste your next two or three yeah. years before you figure this basic thing out. I did. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm glad. Um, but, but I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you really need to realize you're flogging a dead horse, perhaps, mm. um, and to be incredibly negative. Do you know, I've had some of my best ideas when I've been absolutely bottom of the barrel negative. Um, when I've been in one of those foul moods thinking I'm sick of this and I'm sick of that and I'm willing to throw this away and throw that away yeah. is where is, is sometimes yeah. where I have a, have a big breakthrough. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not a positive thinker. I'm also not a negative thinker. Yeah. I'm happy to use both tools. Yeah. Um, uh, I think negative thinking is, is a great way to approach an industry. By the yeah. way. I think, I think if you're, if you're looking at an industry that you want to get into, it's really powerful to have a negative approach and to say, mm -hmm. well, you know, what's not working. What's what are, what's frustrating the hell out of people? What's yeah. the problem? Well, that's where you, know, you see what, the gap, isn't it? Exactly. What problems are showing up? Um, and and uh, and that's that's really powerful. If you if you ask me what I would say creates a lot of success, it's not so much negative or positive thinking, but it's around environment. Mm -hmm. um, there are categorically successful environments, and they're categorically unsuccessful environments. Yeah. Um, so, for example, being part of the startup crowd is categorically an unsuccessful environment. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're constantly hanging around with startups and everyone's in startup mode, um, then you're going to be lumped in with all the other startups. You're going to be viewed as commoditized. Yeah. Um, you're going to be constantly feeling and benchmarking yourself against other startups. And you might be really positive within that context, but it won't get you any yeah. uh, further. If you were to go and hang out with a business, uh, a group of business owners who are all making seven or eight figure businesses already and they're making millions to tens of millions worth of revenue and profits and all that sort of stuff and they're driving Ferraris and they're giving to charity and they're doing all that sort of stuff, what actually might happen is that you suddenly become uh, fresh and new and interesting because yeah. you're the new person. Um, you also might pick up a bunch of insights that you wouldn't have got anywhere else. You might also tap yeah. into investment that you wouldn't have already had. However, you might feel incredibly negative because <laughs> you're now the, you're now the the dunce of the group. Um, so uh, so so hence, I'm more interested in 
I, I'm a really fascinated by the concept of environment dictates performance. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. And that's one of the great things about your, your KPI program is the environment that you set up, the, the coaches that are there, the, um, the, the people. I, I loved your interview process. I think there were about six of us that came to the interview yeah. and only two of us got through. I love, yeah. love the fact that you know it's very much or it appears to be very much based on value and making sure that the right people are getting onto the course and, and that's set up for an incredible environment and the power teams that we all got into and yeah. that was brilliant. Well, the, the, the reason for that is um, is is also self-serving. Um, we have to spend nine months with all of our clients yeah. and, um, and we better pick people that we like. Yeah. <laughs> because, um, because if we're letting, if we're working with just anyone, um, you know, it can suck the energy out of it if we've yeah. got a group of people who we feel very frustrated with their business as well. Yeah. Um, so if we if we from the outset, you know, can't see that this would be a great relationship, then then it's not worth getting into because it's our energy as well. Yeah. Um, on top of that, we have this we have this phenomenal track record. Um, one thing that you know I'm really proud of is that if you Google the hell out of us. Um, you can go ten pages deep, and you you won't find anyone talking about yeah. us in a negative way. Yeah. And yet we charge a reasonable fee. You know, yeah. we charge we charge pretty decent money. Yeah. Um, and you would think, well, you know, God, someone must be saying something negative. Um, but the largely the reason that hasn't happened is because we've been selective as to who we yeah. work with. So we work with people who we know we can help, and we know we can get a result. And we work with people who we like, and who like us. Yeah. And um, and as a result. You know, we get this great track record and all these success stories and case studies, but the but the selection criteria is a big part of it. Yeah, and not enough small businesses are doing that really. And when I say small business, I mean you know that that could be up to five hundred employees still, depending on you know if you're a larger business yeah. than that, you look on that and you say that's a small business. Uh, but you know, it, it's. Um, it is very much about making sure that you are working with the right customers and not being afraid to 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 sack a customer if they if they're not performing or to to say no to a customer in the first place because when you've got your head down working for that customer you're missing the other 100 most amazing people that could be your best customers exactly. ever exactly brand is brand is largely as much about what you say no to as it mm. is to what you say yes to yeah. um Great example is sort of like Apple. You know, Apple were one of the first computers to get rid of um, optical drives, so no CDs or DVD players, and they just took them straight out. They mm. said, "Well, realistically, they take up too much space, and it's old technology, so they, so it's out." Yeah. And a lot of people went up to Apple, you know, geniuses at the at the retail stores, and said, "Hey, well, you know, I want a laptop that has an optical drive in it." And they went, "Well, get something else." You know, <laughs> we're, we're all about the future around here. Yeah. You know, we don't we don't do what's been done. We do what's happening. Yeah. Um, and if you know, and if you want something that's old hat, then that's not us. Yeah. Uh, but they're not afraid to say that. They're, yeah. they're They're very much saying, you know, this is this is who we are. This is what we do, and here's what we say no to. And if yeah. you, if you, um, you know, I, I find one of the biggest mistakes small businesses make is they just say yes to anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and it's funny because it's a it's got an enormous amount of power. When you say that's not what we do, yeah, we don't do that. we don't do that, and that person might not end up buying, but their but their brother in law might be the exact person who, yeah. who is a is a perfect client. Um, so far better to say no, no, no. We we only do this around here. This yeah. is the way we do it, um, as opposed to trying to say yes to everyone. Well, it's the same with your business as well. It's being um, courageous enough, I guess, to be able to say this part of my business isn't working or perhaps there is something else that I could be doing that would work better for me. I, I touched earlier on when, when we did the program that uh, your story about standing on the mountain of value and I was thinking, bloody hell, my God, yeah, well, look what we stood on. You know, we're looking at all these other mountains and look what we stood on here. Please, please share that story with our readers because I absolutely love it. Yeah, well, the, um, the story is based on a climb um, up a mountain called Mount Tipragargan um, on the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And Mount Tipragargan is the largest of a mountain range of five mountains. And these five mountains literally pop up one, two, three, four, five, and there's, it's flat between them. So they just kind of pop, pop up out of nowhere. Um, and... Um, when you climb Mount Tipragargan, it takes about four hours to get up to the top, and 
you, you know, you're pretty tired and thirsty by the time you get up to the top. And you stand there and you get up there and the first thing is you realise that it's all just this broken volcanic rock up on top and there's lots of weeds and there's for some reason there's beetles and flies and all that sort of stuff buzzing around. And, um, and as soon as you look up, you see these other four beautiful mountains and the weirdest thought is, gee, I wonder what it's like to climb that one or I wonder what it's like standing on that one. And, um, and you think to yourself, you know, oh, gee, it's just so beautiful, that other mountain over there. And ironically, you're standing on the largest of the, of the five and, um, and you can't see the mountain that you're on. So, you know, you, you remember the struggle, you, you know that you're a bit thirsty um, uh, you look down and it all looks broken, um, but you're actually standing on this massive mountain. So it's like that with entrepreneurs. They overlook their own story. They overlook their own insights. They overlook um, their own networks and connections. Um, they overlook their own resources. Um, and they look at other people's resources, networks, mm -hmm. connections and ideas, and, and they think, wow, that person's this amazing character. I wish I was more like them or I wish I could have done their journey. I wish I wish I had have gotten into that industry. You know, I wish I wish I had have done, you know, more of what they've done and less of what I've done. Mm. And it completely negates the fact that they are actually standing on a mountain of value. And um and and in many cases they're missing it, which which is understandable. They're too close. Um so it's about having a net, having a group of people around you who can help you to see the the value that you're on. Yeah, and there, there's just so much value. I, I think it's a, a shame, really, that, uh, you know, I meet quite a lot of people that, that, for instance, if you say to them, every everybody's got a book inside them, and they think, oh, no, I haven't. And then they you can see their brain starts to tick, and they go, oh, yeah, actually, I could, I could talk about this, I could talk about that, oh, God, yeah, and then they're on a roll, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, I can't hold you, you know, no stopping you, off you go. And that's such a brilliant thing to see, isn't it, when you see that light switch on. It is, yeah, the book writing process is very powerful for even for just the reason that it stops you looking outside and mm. starts you looking inside for what you've what you're sitting on yeah. yeah yeah very powerful and of course you can then take that book and turn it into products and all kinds of other stuff that you can then use your joint venture partners so I mean it just all leads into what you were saying earlier wasn't it it's having it that does. good pitch around a good product and and having good partners that will be able to to help you take it to a, a larger audience Big time, yeah. It, um, published content, I think, is the DNA of mm. a business these days. It's it's the underpinning um, insights that, that are running that business. Yeah. So let's get down to some nuts and bolts and nitty-gritty stuff then. Yeah, great. <laughs> we like nitty-gritty stuff. So what would you say, in your experience of brand positioning, what are some of the best marketing activities that you've ever invested in? Um, so to keep harping on a little bit about some of the stuff that I talk about every day, you know, whenever we've gotten into any business, we, number one, we get the whole team together and we teach the whole team and we, we coordinate, not teach the whole team, we, we agree as a whole team how we're going to pitch the business. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the, the internal team. So if you have, I mean, can you imagine it? And I, I saw this last week. I saw a technology company, there's six people sitting around a desk and they're all part of this new technology company and they're building a product. And I said, so what do you guys do here? Yeah. And they all sort of went, oh, you say, no, you say, no, no, no you say, right? <laughs> nudge, nudge. And, and, um, and, then, and what became apparent is that they're not actually on the same page as to what they're actually up to. Mm -hmm. They have job descriptions, they have titles, they have, um, you know, a company name and, and maybe they've got a vision or a mission. But, but even just how to explain the business to someone else, they're, all of them didn't want to do it. Yeah. So they end up giving it to one guy who kind of takes 10 minutes to sort of get across what they do and and then, you know, they're all sort of listening in as to how he explains it as well. So you don't want a situation like that. You want to have the entire team, top to bottom, from from the very, you know, most junior person to the very most senior person is all on the same page as how we're going to pitch the business. Mm -hmm. And if and if that ever changes, everyone's got to get on the new page. Yeah. Right, so um, so that's a that's an internal positioning activity or internal branding, I suppose. Because um, in a great pitch, by the way, I'm probably overlooking the structure of a great pitch without explaining it. But in a great pitch, you 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 deal with aspects of clarity and credibility and authentic, uh, uh, authority. Yeah. Um, you deal with aspects of the problem that you're going to solve and the way you're going to solve it. 
the mission behind the business, um, the opportunity that you're, you're, you're trying to see unfold in the world and, mm-hmm. and the brand essence that you're trying to deliver. So you'll, you know, you'll take people through a pitching architecture yeah. so that within two to three minutes they can really deliver a pitch. So and, and that's as important for one person as it is for a business that's got five people. Yeah, so I would say no matter what size your business, mm. one and look, even if you're a one-person business, I would do this activity with your key suppliers yeah. if, if they're up for it. Um, I'd do this um, activity with your, definitely with your spouse, um, you know, so that your spouse understands what the business is. Yeah. Cause, you know, because for many times it's the spouse who gets asked, oh, you know, so what does Daniel do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So have, make sure your spouse has good a good answer. In many ways, they're and your mum and dad. <laughs> and dad um, in many ways, they've got more credibility than you do because yeah, because it's not their business. Um, you know, so and it certainly costs credibility if if, if your spouse says, "Oh, actually, I'm not quite sure." Mm, yeah, <laughs> yes. So um, so you want to make sure that those sorts of things are covered. And if and, and, and if like me, you 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 starting with a team because I always start businesses with teams. That's part of my philosophy. Um, you, you make sure on day one everyone can pitch that business. Mm-hmm. Um, another philosophy that's similar to that is that we all agree upon the brochure for the product. So I don't create products. I start by actually creating what I call the fantasy brochure. Right. And, and if we like, if I was starting from scratch right now today, um, I would start with a team. We'd agree on a pitch, and then we'd all agree and create a fantasy brochure. And the fantasy brochure is the ultimate product that we want to create with the ultimate testimonials yeah. from the ultimate people, um, d- you know, delivered in the ultimate way. And we we would invest a lot of time into producing the the ultimate template brochure yeah. and say that that's what we're creating. So. Um, so we then we publish all the content that would go in that. We're normally looking to create something that's maybe eight to twelve pages long, and, yep. and we you know we really want to produce something that that communicates the value and the offer and the yep. pricing and all of those things that would go into a brochure. And we basically, in the process of creating something like that, we we get very very clear about what it is, and also we create a look and feel. So is this going to be, you know, is this going to be black like a like a AMG Mercedes, or is it going to be colorful you know like a like a kids you know chocolate yeah. bar or sweet you know those snakes or yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what kind of product is it going to be yeah. and what's it going to say you know if we were a car we ask questions like if we were a car company which one would we be would yeah. we would we be, we be all the way up to ferrari or would we be you know a, a, you know, um, a kia or yeah. would we be um you know a uh, a voxel or you know where would we be yeah um and, we, and then we go and have a look at their brochures. So we say, okay, we, we're going to be a BMW. So let's have a look at the way BMW mm-hmm. communicates their brand and the images they use and the, yeah. the colors they use. And let's see if we can build a brochure as a fantasy brochure that starts looking a bit like what BMW would have. Yeah. Um, Great way to do it. Yeah, so, so that's, that's a bit of fun. Um, and, and, um, and we'll write press releases. So we'll, we'll talk about our fantasy press release. You know, so we might... You know, if the if the goal of the business maybe is to sell the business, you'd write a fantasy press release about, um, you know, 2020. We just exited the business for 50 million pounds. <laughs> Brilliant. And, 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 at, and at that particular time, we were operating in you know 10 countries, and we yeah. had a, a team of 150 people, and and we'll put all of that sort of stuff, and and we'll do um, we'll do those sorts of uh, fun ideas. Brilliant. Yeah. And and uh, and I guess once you have that that absolutely nailed, then any marketing that you do is going to have a much higher chance of converting, even if it's just to get a coffee, not to sell them something. Yeah, it's um, it, yeah, it, it, it's as soon as you have that in mind, you benchmark every decision against that. Is it getting me closer to that press release, yeah. or or is it not? Yeah. Um, you know, so that's um, you know, that's the. That's the powerful kind of way of doing it. I'm a big fan of, you know, go into the future, stand in the future, have a look around, yeah, invent it the way you want it, and then uh, and then work backwards from there. Reverse yeah. engineer that. Me too, definitely. It's a, it's a great way to do it. You know, a lot of people are kind of wandering aimlessly through their business life, um, not knowing what good looks like for them. 
Yeah, uh, so they never really... achieve it. They're always frustrated or not feeling like they're getting anywhere, but they don't actually know where it is they want to go. Where they, where they want to go. And look, I can, all, I can also understand that um, many times uh, it's a very, very difficult mental exercise to take yourself through a process. Yeah. So we yes, employ, you know, we have coaches that we work with who they hold, it's what, what's called holding a space yeah. or holding a process. So they hold the process together so we can freely express within the process. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very difficult to coach yourself or to consult, consult yourself. So, so I think um, one, of the, one of the powerful things is to perhaps get someone else to take you through the process yeah. of, um, of doing it. Or well, one of the other things I love doing is I love uh, getting the, our team. So we've got about 30 people on the team now. So I love putting it out there. Hey, guys, what do you, you, know, what do you think? This would look like, or yeah. if we were going to release this document, you know what would, you know what would be on that document. Yes, yeah. um, and getting getting everyone else tuned in, and and and, uh, and and getting and being the one to facilitate that for yeah. others. It can be really empowering as well, can't it, to the people that work with you to, to be given that opportunity. And, and it's amazing. We did this with our team as well before we sold our business last year. Um, we, we did a team day and the responses that came back were massively creative. Uh -huh. and, uh, and you think, wow, I'd never have thought of that. That's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, exactly. That's like inspired I'm genius. Yeah, that's awesome, absolutely awesome. So what would you say are some of the, the mistakes that you've made that you can share with our readers, they can learn from them? Um, well, I mean, one of the biggest mistakes I made was, um, I made the, cla you know, early on I made the classic mistake that most entrepreneurs make of thinking that some piece of technology or thinking that some software or some system or some tactic is going to change the game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you think, oh, you know, I just all I have to do is, you know, if I can just get that auto bot that just trolls through and looks for things, or if I could just get that contractor in the Philippines who writes that ebook for me and mm -hmm. I can pump that out and sell that for thirty nine. You know, all that all that stuff that that you think, oh, you yeah, wouldn't it be great if that worked? Well, um, you know, in my early days in business, I was into a, a lot of those tactics and trying to get those things that work mm -hmm. and um, and eventually I realized nothing works um, it's only the stuff that you're committed to working yeah that, that will work so you've got to you know be the one who's actually driving it um, and uh, and I suppose you know some of the other mistakes I've made is is um, is probably that mistake you know the reason I talk about the mountain of values is because I've been there myself and probably the mistake of going out there looking at other people mm -hmm. and saying Oh, I wish I could do what they're doing, and, and I'll copy that guy. You know, that yeah. guy is making so much money. You know, as a property investor, or that you know, guy is making so much money on the stock market, or that guy who just bought a Ferrari and you know does that thing with furniture. Mm. Right? And it's like, it's like you know, that's not it's not their it's not my it's it's not my place to copy their story. Yeah, it's my place to look at my own mountain of value and make the most of that. So that would be you know one of the other one of the other ones. Um, the, the other mistake links to what you were just saying about harnessing the power of teams and, you know, it's it's easy when you've had a little bit of success to forget that it is really just a team who came together and did it. Um, founders are way overrated. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you know, you say you set up a company, so what, anyone can set up a company, you kicked, off, you kicked it off, great, well done, you made the first sales, great, well done. But uh, as soon as a business becomes valuable, it becomes valuable because of a team. Yes. Um, so, you know, I've made the mistake of not putting enough value in my co-founders and not giving them enough credit. I've made an, the mistake of buying into, you know, the, the illusion that I'm somehow cleverer or more successful than other people. In actual fact, it was, you know, it was my team and, and I was pretty fortunate to be on that team. Mm. Um and and yeah, and just make the mistake of being you know you, the biggest the, one of the biggest mistakes anyone can ever make is being the smartest person in the room. You never ever want to be the smartest person in the room. You want yeah. to have a team of people around you who absolutely make you feel yeah. that um, that you got to pull your socks up. Yeah. Um, so I'm in a very fortunate position now that I would you know I genuinely look around the business and and think this business is full of people who are smarter and more talented than I am. Mm. Um, and and that's a good thing. Oh, that's something to be incredibly proud of. Mm, mm, yeah, exactly. A lot of people, 
a lot of people they don't want that. They want to be the they want to be the the big the big dog. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I'm I'm really proud that it's taken on more of a life of its own and it's attracted highly talented people, and it's it's brought out the talented people. Well, you're now I believe are you in five countries now or is it six now? We're in seven cities. Um, we're in Australia, Singapore, USA, and UK. So four countries, um, seven cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, expanding a brand internationally. You use a word which um, which is very apt. Uh, I, I think uh, is it global the local global yeah. economy um, and uh, you know obviously that just by even being on Facebook now if you're promoting something on Facebook you could be doing with business with somebody in Chicago and yeah. sat there chatting like we are now almost like you're in the same room having a coffee you know exactly and um, but what well, in people this case, I'm I'm in London you're in, you're in France so. <laughs> yes I know with Team International <laughs> um it's amazing that you could be doing business so easily with people across the pond. Um, what would you say, now that you've expanded your business internationally, what would you say is uh, a key lesson you've learned uh, going from one country to another, to another, to another? Um, a, it's very well worth doing um, because it forces you to think about your business in a very different way. So the second city that we opened up was Melbourne from London. So you couldn't pick two more geographically disparate places. Um, you know, you, you, you're getting to the point where you're actually, you know, 26 hours travel um, to go to the second city. Mm -hmm. um, but what that forced us into doing was really thinking about the business in different terms. Um, you know, when you're setting up a second city on the other side of the planet, you've got to think about, well, what carries this business when I'm not there? Yeah. Um, what's the intellectual property? What's... You know, what what makes this business special and unique, separate from me or any, mm. anything that's happening here in London? Um, and that was, I mean, that was, you know, pretty powerful um, activity uh, doing that. I really recommend anyone getting involved in the idea of, you, you know, in the context of the whole world, which is your potential marketplace, yeah. it seems unlikely that your best customers and your best marketplace would be locally. Um <laughs> it's probably more likely that they're somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So you better have a strategy for figuring out where that somewhere else is and how to get there yeah. um, as well as where you are. So, um, so you know, trying to think about your business in global terms is a really powerful uh, thing. For, for, for about two or three years, I used to carry around a little marble of the world and it had, it had the, it was a blue marble with the You gave the me one. Ball. Yeah. I still have it. <laughs> and I used to just spend some time when I when I had some time just thinking about the fact that it's such a small place and that that and I would picture myself sitting out in space looking back at this beautiful little blue and green dot and just thinking wow I can I can do I can go anywhere I like on there and it's it's just a flight away or it's a Skype session away so what do I want to do now I've got this whole little world in the palm of my hand what do I want to do um, and it uh, it's powerful. Yeah, powerful metaphor, powerful way to orientate the mind. Yeah, amazing. Oh, international growth, here we come from all, the, all of our Brown Brains readers. Uh, well, I, I, gosh, I mean, I don't want to take up any more of your time because there's so many great ideas that you've given there. Is there anything that you would like to offer the Brown Brains readers, something special? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of measuring. Um, I think that when you can measure something, you can improve it. Um, and sometimes when you measure stuff, you can be absolutely shocked that what you thought was the problem isn't actually the problem mm. or what you thought um, uh, was a strength may not have been as much of a strength as you thought. Um, so sometimes intuition can be off when there's a lot of moving parts. So I'm a big fan of measuring things. So one of the tools I came up with for people is called the key person of influence test and it's uh, we call it the key person of influence quiz yeah um and it's a series of 40 questions that gives you a score in six different areas and what it scores you on is how well you're pitching um how well you have published content and intellectual property yeah do you have the right sort of products do you have the right profile and do you have the right partnerships and then is that translating into financial success yeah and it can, and just by answering those forty questions, which are all yes no questions, yeah, it can actually tell you a which ones you're strong on and which ones you're weak on. But b, 
Uh, it can go into um, – sometimes you can come out as strong on these areas but weak on the financial success, mm-hmm. which either means there's a lag time and it's catching up or you're in an industry that just doesn't reward yeah. high performance. Um, you know, you're in something that's too small. But it's interesting to know that either way. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I really love – what I love is for people to take that test every six months and just right. see where they've, where they've come and how, how they've moved forward and, and to actually gauge and, and measure. Um, it comes with a 33-page report that gives you ideas on how to improve. Um, it takes all of about 10 minutes to complete. So it's it's one of those little ideas that um, that is about really tuning into where you should focus your attention yeah. and how to do that. Awesome. And how can they get hold of this, Chris? Oh, it's completely free. costs nothing. Um, it's keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash quiz. Easy peasy. Easy as that. Easy, easy peasy. Thank you so much. I'm sure that there's a mountain of value that our readers are going to get from this interview. So thank you so, so much. Have an amazing day. And uh, and I'll let you know when the issue is coming out. Cheers. All the best. Thanks for Take having me Take care, Dad. Yes. Bye.